thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, today I will talk uh, about a very simple uh, thing, so we will work in very simple context. Uh, we will work with uh, abelian, so moduli spaces, of abelian representations of quivers. And we ask the quiver to have no oriental loop, so without. Okay, so this is really the simplest case in, in which you can work uh, in this theory. And uh, I want to mm, describe to you a nice formula that is uh, conjecturally going to compute the Euler number of this uh, of the moduli space of these representations. This formula comes from, from physics and uh, is expressed in terms of some expresses this number in terms of some resi residues called the Jeffrey Kerwin residues uh, of some rational function. So I will proceed by uh, like explaining what I'm uh, doing. So by a sorry by a, a billion representation of a quiver, I mean given a quiver say like this, so without oriented loops, uh, I choose a representation by an abelian representation by putting C at each node and looking at an endomorphisms of these C linear spaces uh, for each arrow. Uh, so the space of representation will be a copy of C for every arrow and uh, we will have a torus action on this, um, on these uh, copies of C by uh, conjugation. So our moduli space will be constructed in the following way. So we will pick a regular value inside the, uh, the uh, dual of the Lie algebra of the torus, a regular value for the momentum map, and we will take the symplectic reduction in this uh, level set. Good. So uh, the Geoffrey Kerwin residue formula expresses the Euler number of uh, the moduli space for this regular value of the momentum map in the following way. So we'll explain in a moment what is this, but this is a sum or a sum finite set of points of some residues denoted in this way, of x, of a rational function. So in the first part of the talk, we'll, uh, I will try to describe what this formula tells you, more or less, and uh, in particular uh, why we are interested in studying such formulas. So here, fr is a rational function defined on the complexified Lie algebra of the torus. And uh, it takes the following form. So fr is going to be up to a sign, which depends on the number of uh, nodes. It's a product over the set of weights of the torus action of these factors. Okay, so what is this? Um, so here, uh, this is contained in the dual the algebra of the torus is the set of weights for, for the torus action on the representation space. Okay, and uh, well, uh, so for every weight, uh, we choose our row to be a real parameter. And uh, we have to say this, uh, for every weight, we call this, well, with this uh, letter M rho, the multiplicity of the weight. So the dimension of uh, uh, the eigenspace of that weight. So the dimension uh, of the sub linear subspace uh, of uh, the space of representations on which the torus acts on with this weight. So the multiplicity 
of rho as a weight. Good. So I've discovered more or less everything that appears in this part. And what is, uh, for example, this MR? Well, this is a, a set of points inside, uh, inside this uh, uh, Lie algebra. And uh, it's uh, constructed as this. Like, uh, you see, this rational function has a poles which are lying on some affine hyperplanes described by these uh, equations, equal to zero. And uh, sometimes these hyperplanes intersect. And uh, if we look at the isolated intersections of these hyperplanes, we find this set here. So this is the set of isolated intersections of hyperplanes of poles. Of far. Good. And notice that for every point in this, then we have uh, that this set defined as a uh, set of weights such that the corresponding hyperplane passes through X eh? is a system of generators for the dual algebra. Good. So I've defined also that one here. And uh, the last thing I have to do is to tell you what this uh, Joffrey Kerman residue is. So I will not uh, explain precisely what it is because it's very technical and it, take, it would take a lot of time. But uh, I can give you an idea of what happens. Uh, so uh, the idea is more or less that you have this rational function defined on the uh, Lie algebra. And uh, in order to take uh, residues, of this uh, rational function, you have to specify a basis so that it becomes a function, like a rational function from C to the N to C. And then you have to specify an ordering of the basis with respect to which you want to take the residue. And this is basically what this Jeffrey Kerman prescription does. So you have that this is a set of, is a generator, a set of, uh, gen uh, a generating set for the Lie algebra, for the dual Lie algebra. And uh, you can extract some basis uh, of the dual Lie algebra out of it. And you can express this FR in terms of this basis, and uh, with respect to this, you can every time take uh, residues. Uh, of course, you have to specify an ordering, but there is a procedure to do this. So, in principle, uh, this Joffrey Kerman residue has more or less uh, a contribution for every basis you can extract from this uh, set of generators. And uh, therefore, uh, if uh, this uh, intersection point of the hyperplanes is very degenerate, is meaning that there are a lot of hyperplanes that pass through this point, this Jeffrey Kerwin residue will be, will be very complicated, a sum of very uh, various contributions. And on, other, on the other hand, if this uh, intersection point is a non-degenerate, meaning that it's the intersection of the smallest amount of hyperplanes uh, that uh, can possibly generate an isolated intersection, uh, then this uh, Joffrey Kerman residue is just uh, computed out of one contribution only of this uh, basis. So, yeah, this is more or less the formula that I want to uh, discuss with you today. And uh, before uh, explaining uh, uh, more things, I would like to focus on, uh, on this. So you have on the left-hand side something that doesn't depend on the choice of these parameters R, and on the right-hand side, you have uh, something depending on R. So part of the claim is that uh, this formula should work conjecturally for every choice of R. So can you write what the left-hand side is, this chi sub? Oh yeah, this is the uh, Euler number for the moduli space of representations of a quiver. So uh, you, you have this uh, space of abelian representations of the quiver. You choose a stability, uh, a regular value, so uh, the, the, the moduli space in principle should be an orbifold, but in this case it's smooth. Okay. And then you compute just the, uh, the Euler number. But of which dimension? Do you fix the dimension on the... On the uh, yeah, the abelian. Abelian, so abelian means abelian. precisely that uh, it's C. Okay, sorry. I mean, I mean, yeah. uh, in general, this is not a big deal because there is a, an abelianization formula that allows to compute uh, this invariant uh, for bigger dimension vectors, uh, reducing to the case of a billion dimension vectors. Okay. 
just by blowing up nodes and, uh, and doing these things. So uh, what, I want, what I wanted to say is that this formula, uh, in fact, is a family of formulas depending on this choice of a parameter r, and uh, they are very different formulas that uh, end up computing the same thing. And um, today we are going to discuss uh, uh, two cases in which uh, uh, we managed to prove uh, that this formula holds true, uh, which are the cases, the opposite cases in some way, the, the case r equal to zero and r going to plus infinity. Um, I will describe them in a, in a minute. But um, first, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, to explain why uh, this formula is interesting. So, because uh, the idea is that we are computing something which is very classically computed. Uh, this Euler number of uh, quiver varieties, uh, in the smooth case at least, has been uh, well known since the works of Reinick and Weist. Um, but in principle, this formula, coming from physics, uh, uh, conjecturally holds in a much bigger generality. Uh, so it should hold for every dimension vector and also for uh, quiver with oriented loops and with uh, potentials. So understanding this formula in a simple case might be the first step to uh, generalize uh, to a much more complicated formula. And another thing uh, that's interesting is that uh, conjecturally from physics, uh, these Jeffrey Kerwin uh, residues which are at, the, at the point they are just an algebraic way to obtain some numbers out of some uh, rational functions, should play a role uh, also in mirror symmetry. Uh, in, to be more precise, uh, they should, uh, like conjecturally, they should describe uh, how to build a mirror of, to some particular Calabi out. And uh, in particular, if we manage to prove this uh, formula, uh, then we have an example of, uh, of this. Um, and the, the, the discussion goes more or less like this. So, uh, you know, there is this uh, construction of a mirror family for a, a particular uh, kind of Calabi house, which is the GHK construction, the Akin Kiel construction, that allows you to compute, to, to construct the mirror family to a log Calabi house surface. And uh, basically, what uh, you have to do once you have a log Calabi house surface is just that uh, you have to realize uh, it as the complement in a Lujenga pair of the boundary divisor. And then you want to construct uh, uh, the a mirror family by studying, um, by constructing this so-called canonical scattering diagram. So you start with the Lujenga pair. Your local ABO is the complement of the divisor in the Lujenga pair. And uh, uh, you have to compute the canonical scattering diagram. And out of this scattering diagram you can construct a mirror family. Uh, but this scattering diagram encodes the uh, information about the gromov witten invariance of this uh, local ABIAO, and in particular Tori blow-ups of it. But uh, the idea is uh, that uh, if we choose this local ABIAO uh, like, uh, precisely in the way we want, uh, like ad hoc local ABIAO, then uh, we are able to apply this discussion to show that this canonical scattering diagram is computed through the Jeffrey Kerwin residues of some uh, rational functions. So, to be more precise, um, if you consider uh, P2 blown up, so you take the toric uh, boundary divisor yeah, maybe in P2 and you blow up some points here and some points on this divisor, uh, then you obtain a Lujenga pair, and uh, you can look at the mirror family. And uh, this mirror family will, will be computed uh, in terms of Gram uh, gramov witten invariance of uh, something which will turn out to be uh, weighted projective spaces. And you compute uh, rational uh, curves that have some tangency conditions on the boundary divisors. And uh, it's well known through something which is called the gromov witten kronecker correspondence. That uh, this gromov witten invariance of the weighted projective spaces can actually be computed in terms of uh, quiver invariance, so Euler numbers of moduli spaces of quivers, of uh, 
some quivers that you can construct uh, uh, ad hoc, which are called uh, complete uh, bipartite quivers. And since we know that the uh, quiver invariance for the abelian moduli spaces of these uh, quivers can be expressed in terms of the Jeffrey Kerwin uh, residues, uh, then we also know that the canonical scattering diagram for this particular uh, Lujanga pair can be uh, expressed in this, in this way. Anyway, this was just motivation. Now I will move on to uh, actually describing this. Uh, This formula. So the motivation was for which types of pairs y and d. Oh yeah, sorry. So the idea is just uh, there are some some Cal some Calabi-Yau surfaces that are uh, built in a particular way, uh, which are called local Calabi-Yau surfaces, which are built out of couples y and d, where d is the divisor in y. I will explain uh, in a moment what these are, and by taking the complement. These are non-compact local Calabi uh, surfaces. Okay. And uh, you have to pick this shoe, of course, in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So Y has to be a smooth, uh, rational surface. And D uh, has to be, an, let's say, an effective anti-canonical uh, divisor. So in particular, uh, it has to be a curve inside Y, which is uh, in the anti-canonical class, and uh, which is nodal. Is Y has to be toric? Or? No. no. Uh, just a smooth uh, rational projective surface. Okay. Um, yeah, and taking the complement, mm. uh, you're obtaining a, a Calabria surface. And there is a way to construct mirrors uh, to these, uh, to these uh, surfaces, which is uh, uh, explained in the work of Gorsak and Kiel. I see. And, and this, uh, this quiver you obtain, what does it look like, you know? Yeah, because uh, the idea is that uh, this uh, mirror that you build uh, in with this uh, construction that Gorsak and Kiel uh, give is built out of something which is called the canonical scattering diagram for this uh, Lujenga pair and encodes the uh, Gromov-Witten theory for this, uh, for the, the, the Calabi-Yau surface, okay? And the idea is that, uh, basically, uh, to, to put it uh, really roughly, the idea is that uh, the Gromov-Witten theory on some of these, uh, uh, on, of these surfaces are uh, computed in terms of uh, uh, this correspondence, are computed in terms of uh, uh, invariance of uh, the moduli space of quivers. And then the idea is to show that these invariants of modern species of quiver are computed in terms of uh, these residues, and then... Uh, uh, I see, I guess my question is, which, which one of these some, some, some y and d? For yeah, all sure. such y and d? No, uh, no, 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 not for all, but uh, I was saying, uh, we take P2, take uh, the toric boundary divisor with uh, the three lines. Yeah, th that was my question, whether it works only for like a toric surface with a toric boundary divisor. Okay, yeah, so the construction in general uh, holds in general uh, this part only for this, yes. Ah, okay. In fact, we construct an ad hoc case in which everything works well. The idea is that this should, th there should be a way to express this scattering diagram also not uh, for this specific example that we build just so that we can use this correspondence and then this, uh, this argument. But uh, yeah, this just served to, um, to give some motivation to, to the formula, which is uh, very nice also by itself. <laughs> and I hope it was a bit more clear now. Yeah, it's, it's clear. I just wanted to know, like, for this this chronic first one, is whether you're looking at toric. But I guess you, the example you're gonna give is. is yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so good. Now what happens? Uh, so I will describe what happens in the first case that we, uh, in which we can actually prove this formula. So uh, we will take this R. So in principle, we will choose a generic R, and the chosen this is generic R, we will let it go to infinity, uh, following the array that starts from the origin. Okay, and the idea is uh, more or less that this formula 
the formula above, for this choice uh, reduces to the idea about localization. So basically, uh, a tier bot organization needs a torus action in your space, so let's describe this, uh, this torus action. So of course, uh, these, uh, these uh, modular spaces are built as symplectic reductions of some, of some uh, torus action over a linear space, which is Hamiltonian. And then uh, you take the symplectic reduction, but since this action is effective, this factors through the action of the full dimensional torus by weight, weight one on the linear space. And therefore, this induces an action of this torus on the modular space. Okay. And we want to consider this action. And one, uh, one sees that uh, since this proves that these this, uh, this modular spaces are toric, toric variety, you just have, in order to compute the Euler number of uh, the modular space, you just have to compute the number of fixed points for this torus action. And these fixed points correspond to uh, representations which are, are supported only on a spanning tree. Uh, a spanning tree means uh, it's a, a subquiver in your quiver which contains, it attaches all the nodes and has one arrow less than the number of nodes and it's connected. So in this case, a spanning tree might be the choice of these two arrows or this two or any two arrows in this case. Um, good, so uh, we, you will have a fixed point for every spanning tree inside the, the quiver, but uh, you have to be careful because not all mm, the representations uh, uh, stay, staying above a uh, spanning tree are uh, size stable. So you have to only consider the number of size stable spanning trees. So you just have to count those spanning trees which are whose modular space of uh, stable re representation is not empty with respect to the stability. Okay. So now, we'll, uh, this, uh, this is a very well-known formula uh, um, studied by Weist. And uh, now we want to rewrite this in another way that uh, becomes uh, this, the, the formula above. So we have uh, this map from the set of arrows of the quiver to the set of weights. Uh, that sends basically uh, an arrow to the weight uh, for the action of the torus on the, the one-dimensional linear space corresponding to the arrow. And uh, the fiber, like the per-image, of this map, uh, via this map of uh, a weight, is what we call the MRA, the multiplicity. And uh, this restricts uh, to something uh, else. So if we take all the arrows uh, generating a spanning tree, these are mapped through this map to something which is a basis extracted from this. So this restricts to a map from spanning trees to uh, basis extracted extracted from the set of weights. Okay. And uh, this means that we can write again our formula in the following form. Uh, so this will be the sum over the basis that you can extract from uh, the set of weights. of a number which is zero or one depending if the spending trees corresponding to a given basis are stable or not, times the fiber of this map, which is this. 
this, where this, uh, this number is just 1 or 0, depending if the spanning tree corresponding to uh, u is size stable or otherwise. Okay, so this is the form that uh, the formula above will take in, uh, in our case. So let's show this. Uh, the idea is that uh, if you took R generic, you can assume that the intersections of the hyperplanes of poles are all uh, non-degenerate. So there are precisely uh, n hyperplanes where n is the dimension of the linear space intersecting at each point. So in practice, uh, this means that uh, this set of isolated points, of isolated inter intersection, is in bijection with a set of bases uh, that you can extract from, uh, from uh, W. And this bijection will send x to u of x. And uh, this means that, in fact, you are computing, uh, the formula above becomes this. So you are summing over the basis. Uh, this Joffrey common residues computed at x of a form. And uh, yeah, you can start uh, comparing these two things, and you actually see that uh, whenever you let r go to plus infinity, staying on this ray, uh, you obtain that this factor tends to this factor, and you obtain uh, this formula. Uh, it's probably also easy to see from there, like, but uh, yeah, I don't, don't think it's uh, nice to see the details. But um, the idea is that So, so did you say, is it because in this generic case, when all, everything is just like in generic, uh, automatically generically, mm -hmm. the, this JK, JK thing is just a product of uh, Yeah, in this case, residues? No, it's just uh, an iterated residue, let's say, because we're working on a big, uh, big space, so it's not just C, it's CN, let's say. Uh, see, so we have very, uh, a lot of uh, variables of which we take the residue. And, and that's this product of m, m rho. That's why it, it is this product of. It. Yeah, because once you take the, the rest of you at one variable, you obtain one, and then uh, you 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 mm -hmm. do again. I mean, it's uh, also kind of possible to see it from here. Um, uh, I mean, this will be so. There are some weights that uh, correspond to to the intersection in that point, and. Uh, with, and you are computing the, the residue with respect to the, the basis given by those weights. So for those weights, this part here will be just the variable you are computing the residue with respect yeah. to, okay? And also this, I don't know. And then there are other components which will not contribute because we are letting R to go to infinity. And then if you are computing this, the residues of these things with respect to UI, you obtain this guy. Because this is one plus one over ui to this uh, this thing. Okay, so this is a very. Uh, uh, I see. So r sent to infinity. You just send. Yeah, yeah. The, the contribution of the other factors will be just one, because uh, it will be one plus one over something plus r. And yeah, the the point is, I, w I wanted to discuss this uh, also later. But this, if you take r generic. You still have a sum over spanning trees over this basis, but uh, the contributions that will come from this uh, will be very dependent on this R, and it's uh, it's uh, kind of difficult to to interpret this uh, in terms of localization procedures, because the, also the other formula that I will describe, like the one you obtain for R equal to zero, is something that uh, comes from a localization procedure, a very different one. For also for a different torus, not not even the same torus, and so the question might be: What happens with the formulas that are in the middle? Uh, can we interpret them in localization way? 
and I don't know it. <laughs> so yes, I will maybe keep the formula. So let's now discuss the case of r equal to zero. So uh, in this case, uh, we have to take completely a different point of view. And uh, we use a localization formula, which is called the jaffa kerman localization formula. With, you know, uh, it looks uh, obvious because uh, these uh, residues are called jaffa kerman residues, but actually the name is, these residues have been defined by different people, by uh, Brown and Verne and uh, for different reasons, and also you can apply them to compute residues of uh, every meromorphic form function that you like, as long as it has uh, the poles on these hyperplanes. So it's not uh, really obvious that uh, uh, this formula comes from a localization procedure. But in, for r equal to zero it does. Um, and uh, yeah, what is this uh, Jeffrey Kerwin localization procedure? Uh, it's a uh, a different formula, uh, you know, a about localization formula tells you uh, how to integrate over manifolds, compact manifolds, which have a torus action, uh, and then you produce invariance by integrating chair classes of uh, things. Uh, on the other hand, this uh, Jeffrey Kerman localization formula tells you how to integrate on quotients of a uh, torus action by, uh, of, of a quotient by Hamiltonian torus actions. And uh, let's, I, I will describe what this formula is, what form does it take in uh, the simplest case of an S1 action over a manifold. So, in general, this formula is very famous. The, the Joffre Kerman localization formula is famous because uh, it works also for non abelian group actions, but it takes a very complicated form. And in, uh, in the Taurus case, it takes a much more simpler, sim much simpler form that can mm, be shown to be the same of this uh, formula here. So in the S1, S1 case, uh, you need to be working on a symplectic manifold. So you also have a symplectic form here, and you want this action to be Hamiltonian. So you have a momentum map from this to the dual of the Lie algebra of S1, which we identify with R by choosing a generator, let's say the, the, the curve going with around the origin uh, counterclockwise. And uh, good. So, in order to apply this procedure, we have to impose two conditions on this, uh, this action. Uh, in principle, this, uh, this action has been studied for action on compact uh, manifolds, but uh, we don't work to, to restrict to this case because uh, we will be applying it to uh, torus action on uh, linear spaces. Uh, so, we want to impose the following conditions. So, mu, the momentum map, has to be proper. And uh, mu has a minimum. Okay, so in this uh, context, I said we want to integrate things on the quotient, and uh, so we, of course, we choose a regular value for the momentum map. We want to integrate things on. Uh, the symplectic reduction, and the things we want to integrate are of this form. So, yeah, our alpha, where alpha is an equivariant cohomology class coming from M, and this R function is called the Kirwan map, and it's defined in, in this way. So this is just the equivalent restriction, and then you have this isomorphism um, with the quotient that holds just because we are taking uh, the regular value. So in particular, if, this, uh, if the action on S1 on this is uh, actually free, uh, this isomorphism holds because uh, it's uh, induced by a normal entropy equivalence, otherwise it's just, uh, um, it, it holds anyway, but also for locally free actions. Uh, good. 
And uh, in general, like if uh, the momentum map is proper, then this R is surjective, and we can always compute integrals for all uh, forms on uh, quotients. Good. So I will roughly explain uh, what this, how do, to derive this localization formula. We haven't written the localization part. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I will uh, actually derive it, and uh, you will see it. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're right. Absolutely. So uh, the idea is the following, more or less. Uh, you can construct uh, out of uh, your uh, symplect, like your symplectic manifold with the torus action. You can construct uh, a new. Uh, symplectic manifold with a new torus action such that you have a lot of control on the fixed loci of this uh, new space. So in particular they will be uh, your original symplectic reduction that you want to study and some of the fixed loci of the original action. Therefore you will be able to apply a Tiabot localization theorem to this place and explain, express the integral over the wall space in terms of the integral on the symplectic reduction plus the integral on the other fixed points and with some uh, trick, then uh, you obtain your localization formula. So the picture uh, one should have in mind is just the action, let's say, the S1 action on uh, the, the sphere by rotation around the z-axis. And this is Hamiltonian, the momentum map is just the height function. And uh, of course this is compact, so the two conditions are satisfied. And the idea is that when you choose uh, a regular value for the momentum map, then you can look at the level set and cut your space at this level set. This space still has a, an S1 action, okay? And uh, then you quotient by the S1 action only on this boundary. So you, you obtain another space, which is compact, on which you have an S1 action, uh, but on which you have a lot of control on the fixed points. In, in, in this case, uh, it's, uh, this guy is a point only because uh, the level set is an orbit, but in general this is not the case and will be, this will be your symplectic reduction at the original, in the original space. And the only other fixed points are in this case this one, which correspond to this one. So it's the set of fixed loci which are set, sent by the momentum map to, fixed, to, to, to points which are smaller than xi to real numbers which are smaller than xi. So this is the picture. And uh, yeah, the idea how to, do, to, to define this, uh, this space is just uh, to extend the S1 action to m times c in the following way. So you have the action of this in the simplest way you can imagine. Uh, this, this is still Hamiltonian with respect to this uh, momentum map. And, uh, and you can take the symplectic reduction as, uh, at your uh, regular value. And what you obtain is uh, this space. Uh, yes. And uh, you can check uh, the, you have a residual S1, uh, S1 action uh, and uh, the fixed loss will be uh, these ones. So once you, once you apply a Tiabot localization theorem in this context, then you have that for every beta, the, the, the new symplectic reduction I will denote with uh, this notation. Is the new symplectic reduction. Okay, uh, good. So uh, applying a Tiabot here, you obtain that for every uh, equivariant homology class on the quotient, like the, the action on the quotient is. Uh, is the residual one. So you have this uh, okay. I think 
think there's something wrong. The n should be pre-image of uh, of the set of things less than than c, no? Uh, where here? Yeah. No. Uh, so the th the idea is uh, if you if you do this uh, this uh, I mean this is not the same uh, uh, momentum map as mu. So ah. you have m which is uh, symplectic on which s acts. And uh, there is an Hamiltonian action with momentum map mu. Okay, and this is one thing. Then you extend this action to m times c, times c. Oh, okay. and you, this is still Hamiltonian but with a different momentum map. And if you do the simplex reduction with respect to this momentum map, you obtain this guy here. Okay, and uh, uh, and uh, once you apply the about uh, localization. Uh, to this uh, new setting. N uh, notice that uh, this uh, simplicity reduction is uh, compact uh, since uh, mu is proper, uh, because uh, this uh, phi will still be proper, and uh, uh, yeah, because mu is proper and uh, uh, strictly convex. So uh, this phi is still proper and the simplicity reduction is compact. So we can still apply a Tiabot. So for every equivariant form of this, this kind, we, we can integrate it. And obtain a formula. Uh, this of this form. This is just the application of a Tiabot. Okay, so the idea is uh, you are just uh, computing the integral over this uh, new simplex reduction with respect to the restriction of your uh, your uh, equivalent cohomology class uh, to the fixed velocity of the action, which in case are m xi, so your original simplex reduction, which is injected in this space through this map j m xi, okay, and uh, the fixed velocity of your original. Uh, action on the manifold M, which still we have a way to inject them in uh, this, through these maps, but only those for which the momentum map uh, maps them to a value less than xi. Good. And then the idea is just you have to study this uh, localization, uh, this, this integral a little bit, but you notice that, okay, uh, one thing, uh, M xi is a uh, one codimensional in this. So if you take uh, beta to be of the same degree of mxi, then uh, the integral over mxi, sorry, of m on the new simplectic reduction of beta is zero. So you can actually disregard this part. And uh, what you can do is that you can actually compute some of the things here. So for example, uh, this is an equality in the equivariant cohomology of a point, or point, which is the equivariant cohomology, so which is just the singular cohomology of CP infinity. And we can think of it as C of t, but of course C t is the churn class, the first churn class of the one bundle over here. But of course we have to localize at t. So, and yeah, we have to localize at t. Okay. And so you can compute this, uh, this Euler class here. And uh, okay, it's a lift of the Euler class of the normal bundle. So it will be something of the form, of the, the, the Euler class, the usual Euler class of the normal bundle. So plus, something uh, which just by degree arguments you can say that it is uh, something like this but uh, you can check uh, it's a minus t okay and uh, some other things you can do is that you can check that for every alpha equivariant cohomology class in uh, m there exists a beta such that the 
pull back of this of beta is equal to r of alpha, the pullback over the symplectic reduction, and uh, the pullback over the fixed points of beta is actually the pullback of uh, alpha, where this time you're looking at your fixed loss inside uh, the original manifold. Okay, and so let's write again uh, what this is. So this gives you uh, the following formula, like the integral of uh, R alpha over omega minus t on the symplectic reduction is uh, minus the sum over this of these integrals. Uh, okay, and so this is a, like I cheated a little bit, but this uh, Euler class or the normal bundle is the same for the normal bundle of F inside the new symplectic reduction and also inside the original space. Good, so we are still working in uh, C, T, localized T, and in the in particular, inside the integral, we are working uh, in uh, the equivalent cohomology of M psi, which being a fixed, fixed locus, it's uh, this guy. So what I'm saying is that this thing, before taking the integral, lives here. And in this localization, this integral, this uh, object can be written again in uh, this way. I'll just write in this way, but it's the same thing. Come on. So we're looking to do what does omega minus t means? Yeah, I will. Uh, I will uh, address this in a second. Okay. Yeah, this is the geometric uh, series. Okay, and uh, the the trick is that this uh, makes sense. Uh, because we are working in this yeah. space, and omega is uh, an important element, because uh, it's a, uh, it's the, it's the Euler class. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't call it omega. I'm very sorry. Uh, this Euler class. Uh, yes. It doesn't have to do with omega of the manifold. Oh yes. Come on. Yeah. No, no. You are absolutely right. <laughs> uh, no, no. You are one hundred percent right. So, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. So this is a two form, uh, actually, uh, a, a cohomology class of a uh, degree two uh, over the space, a singular cohomology class. I see. So it's so a symplectic form on the space. Uh, it's just the Euler class of the normal bundle. The class of the normal yeah, yeah, it's, that, it's precisely that. Like uh, this is this is uh, this thing is the form that this guy takes, ah, okay. just replacing the the thing that I brought okay. here. Okay, so it's just uh, a true form there. And uh, the trick is that this guy being really important, uh, because, I mean, it's a differential form, so you can pick, okay? Um, this uh, sum is finite. And uh, this is equality holds in that localization. And then you just take the residue at t. And what you get is that this is uh, uh, the residue at t equal to zero of this uh, sum of the integral of this. We're summing over the fixed loss i, which are mapped to something less than psi. So this is the baby case of the localization formula of Jeffrey and Kerwin, and this was uh, proven by Kalkman uh, in the Swan case. And then, I don't know how much time I, I have still, uh, if I have any. Maybe like five and then we'll open for Five is perfect, yes. So what I do is just uh, give you an idea of uh, the generalization to the torus. Uh, let's, let's work here. So this will be just a rough idea to say more or less what happens in our formula here above. So I said, uh, in the r equal to zero case, in the r equal to zero case, 
or actually you are in the most degenerate case possible because there is only one point, which is the origin. All the hyperplanes are linear hyperplanes. So there is only one intersection point. And therefore this guy is very big. It's the whole set of weights of the torus. And so this Jeffrey Kerman residue will be very complicated. A sum of many uh, iterated residues. And I want to just give an idea of how this uh, integracy appears in the combinatoric integracy appears in the uh, Jeffrey Kerman localization formula there. So the idea is basically let's discuss what happens for a, a two torus section. So let's say over a linear space. And what happens is that you can look in the duality algebra of the torus, and you have the image of the momentum map, which will be something like this. Okay, so not in general, uh, but we require it to be uh, of this form. So we need uh, what I'm saying is we need uh, uh, these two conditions translated to the more to, to the higher dimensional context, which uh, which are simply that mu is still proper, and uh, this condition is is replaced by the fact that mu is uh, as a closed image and um, uh, it's, uh, the image is strictly convex. So you need the strictly convex uh, uh, momentum cone. And uh, basically you will have some rays inside this momentum cone. Who are these rays? Uh, these rays are the singular values of the momentum map, which are determined by the weights of uh, the action. And uh, the idea is uh, now you have your regular value at which you want to consider the simplicity reduction and uh, you do this thing. You pick a, a line, a random line, L, which by strict convexity of the cone can't lie uh, all inside of uh, the cone. And uh, you look at this per image. And you realize that there is a, a one codimensional torus so one codimensional sub-torus in, in this torus, so in this case a one torus, uh, that acts locally freely on this thing. How? Uh, you just find its Lie algebra as uh, the orthogonal of the line, mm, like you, you take this line, you translate it to uh, the origin, you take the orthogonal, you find the Lie algebra like this. And then you see that this uh, action is locally free, and uh, you notice that if you take the quotient, you obtain uh, something which is still symplectic because you can realize it as a symplectic reduction. And uh, it has an S1 action on it, which is the one of the residual torus. Okay. And uh, this, uh, as I said, this guy is still a symplectic manifold. And uh, the point is uh, the momentum map for this action will be more or less uh, the restriction of this, the, of mu, to this space, okay, to this set, and the image will be this. So you can identify the dual Lie algebra of this with this line. Okay, so you see the image of the momentum map has a minimum, like the, the momentum map has a minimum, and uh, it is still proper because it's a restriction of mu. So you can apply this uh, localization formula that we had before. And it will express the integrals of the symplectic reduction for this action, which is our symplectic reduction, in terms of the integrals of uh, some fixed uh, loci, which are those that are mapped to something that is less than psi. And they will correspond to these values of the momentum map. Okay? And what, uh, what they will be is they will be uh, also symplectic reductions for other actions. So this, let's say, Let's consider this, uh, this point here. The fixed point will be, uh, so this ray is a singular value of the momentum map because uh, there is uh, a submanifold uh, inside uh, M and the subtorus Ti of, uh, of uh, T that acts trivially on this thing. So you can consider this action on this. And uh, the idea is that uh, a fixed locus for this action will be the symplectic reduction at this point 
of uh, this uh, for this action. Okay, so you will uh, be able to express more or less this integral of uh, mxi in terms of a sum of integral of mxi i of ri of alpha i, which is obtained by taking a residue of alpha at some point, in some way. And then you apply again the formula. And this means that you have to look for a line inside this hyperplane and uh, for, for, every intersect, for every fixed point. So also a line here. And then you go on like this and you obtain an, arra an arrangement of lines inside this dual uh, Lie algebra. And this arrangement of lines is what gives you, like for, for every path that starts from here and arrives to the origin following this arrangement of lines, you have an iterator residue. And this is the integrity that arises in that thing. The last thing I want to say is that you, there is a canonical way to choose these lines. So for every, line, every, every choice of these lines, you obtain a valid formula. But there is a canonical way to choose these lines so that you obtain uh, uh, precisely the Geoffrey Kerr one uh, look at, uh, residue formula. So that was uh, all. And if you have questions, please. Okay. Please thank you, Ricardo. Thank you. Anyone have a question for Ricardo? Okay, maybe I have more questions for Ricardo, <laughs> which is, uh, I just wanted to, uh, this quick thing about this last part, it, uh, in this case, uh, can you see this invariance with respect to, um, like if you choose a different, a kind of a different path, you're supposed to get the same formula, yeah. right? It's a very similar thing, like it, it looks like it should be the same, because you see, as you said, here moving the line, moving the, the, the various lines that we choose, we obtain mm, different formulas for the same uh, invariant, and here changing the R. Changing R also get different. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be the same thing. Like it doesn't seem to be uh, the same. Uh, Maybe it's invariant under both of them. Yeah, yeah, it looks like. Uh, and yeah, the, the the strange thing is that uh, this more or less uh, is a formula that encodes both a tier bottle localization and this Joffrey Kerman localization. One is a localization for the torus action on the quotient, and the other is a localization for an Hamiltonian torus action on the uh, space of representations. So it would be nice to, to give, like, to understand what, why it's there. Uh, so like generic R, you even don't know uh, which action you have to consider. Yeah, I don't know what, what I'm doing. <laughs> but uh, still, for a generic R, uh, you still have uh, a sum over the spanning trees, uh, but uh, these guys will depend uh, continuously on R in a non-trivial way, and yeah. But it, it, is it known if it should hold like for every R? Yeah, yeah, it's a conjecture actually. In physics, they, they, actually, uh, they actually have a proof in physical language um, by Benini, Hori, uh, Iger, and Tachikawa. Uh, and uh, there are many papers, one, uh, uh, Piolin, uh, uh, Manchot, Sen, I think, uh, which explain this formula and uh, provide examples in which the, it holds, and also checking it numerically, it's perfect. But uh, still, uh, and also it should work in much greater than generality than, than this. This is just the baby case for a billion uh, quivers and, uh, and in the smooth case, but it should also hold for uh, quiver with oriented loops, so very degenerate modular spaces and, uh, and all dimension vectors. Like, where, where did you use the fact that you had no oriented loops in, in your proof of this? Okay, uh, let me think. Uh, basically, in every, uh, like, for the Tiabot theorem, uh, you use that, um, because uh, uh, otherwise there are several, I think, uh, more, more fixed points for the action, I think, or even yeah. It's because you want to have a projective on your space? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yes, you don't have a compact thing. Uh, and uh, I think the, the situation is much more difficult. Yeah, basically, compactness is probably the, the biggest problem. Yeah, in the mirror, when you um, briefly described them, this um, relation also with the gross second kill uh, construction. Um, if I got correctly, this Jeffrey and Kiwa residue will play the role of the gromo witten More or less, yes. But like, which one for which type of R? Uh, yeah, for the uh, R going to plus infinity. Uh, like, uh, the, 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 in the case of Pichublon, at, at some points, the formula you obtain are the ones that uh, 
you obtain by having r to plus infinity. So for the other case, you don't have, at least even for r equal to zero, you don't have... At the moment, uh, I don't. I don't know. But is there a reason why you... Yeah, uh, there are several f uh, papers in physics. I, I don't know any concrete reason because uh, I don't understand it, those papers, but uh, there are several claims about this. Uh, they, they should be computing uh, correlation functions of uh, uh, honest two or uh, several things, which... So I have some reference for this if you're interested, but uh, I can't uh, directly provide you. An, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Okay, so let's thank Ricardo again for the great talk. Thank you.